All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started here. Uh, so my name is Chris Pennell. Uh, I'll be moderating uh, this webinar today. Uh, this site webinar is called A Point of Care Ultrasound for Diagnosing Pediatric Appendicitis. Uh, before we begin, please be advised that alt attendees are muted. Uh, you can type your questions into the QA box at the toolbar located at the bottom or side of your screen, and we'll conduct a Q&A session at the end of this presentation. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and archived for future reference as well. Uh, here with us today, we have Dr. Marla Levine. Uh, Dr. Levine is the Director of Point of Care Ultrasound at Monroe Carroll Jr. Uh, Children's Hospital at Vanderbilt. She's also an Associate Professor of Pediatrics at Vanderbilt University. Uh, Dr. Levine is boarded in Pediatrics and Pediatric Emergency Medicine, and she completed an Emergency Ultrasound Fellowship following her PEM training. Dr. Levine has been an educator in Port of Care Ultrasound, or POCUS, for the last 10 years, having lectured locally, nationally, and internationally on POCUS in the care of children. Her academic interests include POCUS education, medical education, and gender equity issues. She recently published an expert panel curriculum tool for PEM POCUS Fellowship and has recently published a PEM POCUS uh, competency checklist for POCUS within PEM Fellowship. Uh, Dr. Levine, we're super excited to have you here with us, so I'll go ahead and turn it on over to you. Thank you so much for joining me today. Today we're going to be discussing point-of-care ultrasound for the diagnosis of pediatric appendicitis. My only disclosure is that the content of this lecture is not proprietary of, nor does it represent the views of Vanderbilt University, Vanderbilt University Medical Center, or Monroe Carroll Junior Children's Hospital at Vanderbilt. So the objectives of this talk. Today we're gonna to discuss appendicitis and its clinical significance. We're gonna discuss the history of appendicitis imaging. We're gonna review relevant literature that describes point of care ultrasound for appendicitis. And throughout this talk, we're gonna be using cases to demonstrate how point of care ultrasound can be used in your practice. So to start us off, a case. This is a previously healthy seven-year-old male who, uh, whose immunizations were up to date, who presented to the emergency department with abdominal pain that started about 36 hours prior to presentation. Mother reports the child has had approximately three episodes of non-bilious, non-bloody vomiting over the last day he also had a single episode of diarrhea. Mom denies a history of cough or congestion or fever, but she did note the child had decreased oral intake. His medical history is, is notable for constipation. He has no surgical history and his family history is non-contributory. So his review of systems were notable for abdominal pain that he localized to the periumbilical region. Also three episodes of non-bilious, non-bloody vomiting, a single episode of diarrhea and some decreased oral intake. On physical exam, his vital signs were fairly unremarkable. He did look a little tired, non-toxic, no signs of dehydration, but he was lying still in bed. His ENT exam was negative, his lungs were clear, his cardiac exam was normal rate and rhythm. On abdominal exam, he had a soft belly, but the tenderness was noted both on the right upper and lower abdominal quadrants, as well as point of maximal tenderness around the periumbilical region. His GU exam was negative with normal non-tender testicles bilaterally, and his extremities noted uh, brisk kept refill bilaterally. So we placed an IV and sent off labs. We gave him Zofran, a normal saline bolus, and morphine, and we ordered a radiology ultrasound. So I saw this child after having already completed my ultrasound fellowship. And so as was customary for me, I brought the ultrasound to the bedside to see what I could see. And after I placed this ultrasound, the ultrasound probe in his right lower quadrant, I found what was the cause of this child's abdominal pain. So what we can see here is a, is a circular structure with a fairly defined wall with some hypoechoic um, fat stranding around the um, appendix. And so at that moment, I knew that I had diagnosed the cause of this child's pain. We had appendicitis. Measuring out in the cross-sectional diameter, his appendix measured at 0.94 centimeters, which is consistent with the diagnosis of appendicitis. And then we were able to um, image in a long axis as well, demonstrating that there was this was a blind-ended structure, structure consistent with appendicitis. And so at that point, I knew that I could cancel my radiology ultrasound. Um, I had made the diagnosis. 
at the institution where I was working, I had already established this working understanding with my surgeons such that when I found appendicitis at the bedside, they took my imaging and used that to um, do definitive management on patients. So he um, was able to take my images and he agreed with my assessment and booked the operating room for an appendectomy. And the image on the left was actually the screenshot image of what I sent to the surgeon. And the image on the right was what he sent me a few hours later after child underwent appendectomy. So let's talk appendicitis. Abdominal pain is a very common presenting chief complaint to emergency departments. The 2013 National Hospital Ambulatory Medical Care Survey cited approximately 800,000 annual abdominal pain visits in children under the age of 15. Appendicitis is the most common surgical cause of abdominal pain in children. And here's the rub, is that appendicitis can present with variable symptomatology. For us as providers, missed appendicitis is one of the most successful malpractice claims brought against emergency physicians and pediatricians. So this is particularly uh, a vulnerable place for us as providers. Okay, so a little history lesson. As long as there's been humans, there's been reports of diseases of the appendix. However, the understanding of appendicitis was not known until the 19th century. Borhav, who was a, um, a medical expert of the time, describes in the first reported documentation of right lower quadrant abdominal pain, he describes this iliac passion, which was right lower quadrant abdominal pain. And he um, expanded on the medical management of the time, which was bloodletting, um, series of tinctures and enemas. Claudius Amiant was actually the first described appendectomy in the literature. Um, he, he was the first to perform the first appendectomy, but his was not uh, intentional as an appendectomy. He actually was performing a hernia repair, noted a fistula, a colonic scrotal fistula, and during the operative management, found a pin in the appendix and removed it. In 1886, at the very first meeting of the Association of American Physicians, Herbert Reginald Fitz was the first to describe appendicitis. In his paper, he described perforating inflammation of the vermiform appendix. And this was the first description of the vermiform appendix and its clinical implications. Now, notably, Dr. Fitz was actually um, a pathologist and his work was in postmortem evaluations. He also was the first to coin the term appendectomy. 100 years later is the first description of how ultrasound could be used in the evaluation of appendicitis. Pilot published a paper in which he described the graded compression approach to the diagnosis of appendicitis. And what the graded compression approach is, is this effort with your ultrasound probe to displace bowel gas in order to see the contents of the right lower quadrant. Notably, in his study, he was only able to find infected appendixes and was never able to find the normals. So up until the 21st century, appendicitis was a clinical diagnosis. The provider would put hands on the belly using clinical information about the symptom development, would use that to describe, decide which are the patients that need to go to the OR for an appendectomy and which are those patients that probably don't need to go um, and have the appendix removed. Not surprisingly, this carried a very high negative appendectomy rate. So about 20, 20, 20 to 25% of appendixes were actually normals that were removed. And around the turn of the 21st century, the turn of the century, there began to be an understanding that maybe this wasn't the best approach, that going to the operating room carries its own risk. And maybe we need to be a little bit more intentional about who does have appendicitis and who doesn't. And so there began to be this movement towards imaging all people who are concerned, where there's clinical concern for appendicitis. And CT was the imaging modality of choice, largely because of the wide availability of CT scans. Well, over the last 20 years, there's been a 
greater and greater understanding that exposing children and young adults to ionizing radiation is probably next, not the best approach because ionizing radiation carries significant risk to our patients. And so this principle of as low as reasonably achievable really began to be that understanding um, and the guiding force for those uh, who care for children that we need to really negotiate um, which is the best approach for making the diagnosis versus um, exposure to ionizing radiation. And so over the last really 20 years or so, um, because the pediatric appendicitis score and Alvarado scores were developed in about around the year 2005, 2007, um, we now use the, these approaches or institutional clinical practice guidelines to decide which of those patients that need to go for operative management, which are those patients who probably don't need any further imaging because their signs and symptoms are not consistent with appendicitis, and who are those patients, those patients in the middle who we're not really sure if they have appendicitis or not, who would really benefit from further imaging. And so really the pendulum swung. There was a pendulum swing. What was once a clinical diagnosis now really is um, a diagnosis that requires imaging. And this is because appendicitis really presents as a clinical conundrum. You know, the signs and symptoms of appendicitis being fever, abdominal pain, vomiting, diarrhea, and anorexia really carry a very wide differential. And so it could be challenging being faced with these symptoms to know what's going on with the child. It could be a symptom, as, it could be as simple as a viral illness or it could be appendicitis. Now, I would say the migration of pain, if that's one of the historical signs, pain that has moved to the right lower quadrant, that's much more specific for the diagnosis of appendicitis. Additionally, your physical exam could be also not terribly helpful because a patient with, with appendicitis can present with right lower quadrant abdominal pain. They could present with periumbilical abdominal pain. They could present with epigastric abdominal pain or suprapubic abdominal pain. They can even present with groin or hip pain. So your physical exam may not be terribly helpful either um, as you're trying to make this diagnosis. Um, I would argue hop tenderness or some people do um, heel tap. Um, these kind of um, signs, um, if they're positive, meaning if you have the patient jump and they endorse right lower quadrant pain, that's much more specific for appendicitis. And I would argue if that's present, you should definitely proceed along, along your appendicitis algorithm. Adding to the clinical conundrum are our, our youngest patients. Children under the age of five are incredibly hard to diagnose um, with appendicitis, largely because they can't tell you what they're experiencing. Um, often they'll present to their, to their pediatricians or to the peds emergency department with very nonspecific symptoms. Um, and often on first presentation, they get missed. Um, and so not infrequently when they come to presentation um, with, uh, with more signs and symptoms consistent with appendicitis, often they've already ruptured or, or present peritonitic or in sepsis. So we're not good as a medical community um, in diagnosing our youngest uh, children, those under the age of five. And so it really does take a high index of suspicion in these patients to pick up those appendici appendicitises before they're ruptured. So how do we mitigate the conundrum? Well, we're gonna use all the information that we have available to us to make this diagnosis. So we're gonna use our history and physical exam. We often will use labs. So CBC and a CRP as part of our practice. We have in our shop basically a practice guideline that uses a lot of the, the features of the pediatric appendicitis score. Many children's hospitals do this. Um, and that helps us decide which are the children that need to go for imaging. Um, and at most shops, there's a choice to be made, be it ultrasound, CT scans, or in some, in some institutions, they even have MRI available. So you have options and we're doing um, a discussion right now on ultrasound and, and I'm a very, very strong believer in the important place that ultrasound has in the um, diagnosis of appendicitis when there's a clinical concern, um, largely because this is um, 
you know, the, the best imaging modality in terms of safety profile for children being that there's no exposure to ionizing radiation. But as you can see, the test characteristics for ultrasound are not as strong as those test characteristics for things like CT scans and MRIs. And the reason is that ultrasound imaging is highly operator dependent. So if you have a sonographer that's exceptionally skilled in doing ultrasounds for appendicitis, they're gonna pick up those normal appendixes as well as those, those inflamed appendixes. However, if you're working with a sonographer or if you yourself are the sonographer are new to the skill set, you'll probably note that your diagnostic accuracy won't be terribly strong as you're starting out. And that's one of the challenges with ultrasound is that um, the test characteristics are not as strong as some of the other options available to us. Now, CT scans have amazing test characteristics. You're gonna probably see nearly 100% of negative appendixes or normal appendixes, as well as picking up almost 100% of those inflamed appendixes. However, that's at, at the expense of exposure to ionizing radiation. Now, I would argue MRI is probably that, that um, the, the holy grail, that perfect imaging um, modality, um, given that the test characteristics are except, exceptionally strong and you're not exposing your child to ionizing radiation. However, as we all who practice in, in hospitals know, that's just not standard. Most, most hospitals don't have MRIs or fast MRIs available to um, the emergency department for the diagnosis of appendicitis. And so even though it's an excellent imaging modality, for many of us, that's not even something to consider in our diagnostic workup. The story of emergency provider performed our ultrasound really started around 2001 when ASEP endorsed specialty specific guidelines, namely point of care ultrasound applications um, that should be performed by emergency providers in the care of patients. In 2008, ASEP put out a policy statement endorsing 11 applications that all emergency medicine residents should have skills in at the time of their graduation from residency. For us in Pete's emergency medicine, the story is a little bit shorter um, because we only got endorsement um, with our own policy statement back in 2015. And it really is over the last 10 years or so that the question about whether or not we as emergency providers could perform point of care ultrasound for appendicitis really became a hot topic. And um, many studies have been performed in the last 10 to 15 years looking at this particular question. Since 2015 though, I would say this was really the time where things changed for us as PEAS emergency providers because not only was there this endorsement that we can uh, do point of care ultrasound in our practice, but really that we should, that it's really good practice for our patients. And so for those of us who care for children, um, this focus and, and understanding that the pediatric abdomen studies are incredibly common in our practice. Um, it has really been um, the, our work to try to become better and better at doing these pediatric abdominal applications to improve the care of our patients. So how do we do this? So in this lecture, I have two clips that are gonna demonstrate the approach to the appendicitis um, point of care ultrasound application. And this is our first clip. All right, with the probe marker pointing towards the patient's right, we're gonna put the probe down on child's belly. This will correspond to the right lower quadrant. On the screen, we can see Looking down, you can see the cross-section of the psoas muscle and the iliac vessels. Iliac vessels show color flow Doppler. It's in this location that we're going to start scanning using a graded compression approach to try to find the appendix. It's not uncommon to see a few lymph nodes in proximity to the organs of interest, the psoas muscle, the iliac vessels, and peristalsing bowel. 
as you can see, my probe is always in the right lower quadrant and I'm just putting gentle pressure to try to displace bowel gas and see the anatomy. And that is the approach to the appendix ultrasound. So I hope the first thing that you noted was that I was using a linear probe. And using a linear probe is really important because what we're looking for is really fine detail in the right lower quadrant. You may have also noted bowel surrounding the structures that we were intentionally looking at, namely the psoas muscle and the iliac vessels. Large bowel will come into view as a large caliber luminal structure. It's often filled with air or stool. And you'll note the haustral folds, those ridges, um, in, in the bowel. Small bowel has a smaller lumen and it has the internal valvulae conventes. It's often liquid filled and it will be seen peristalsing. Now, one thing to note is that from the stomach all the way down to the colon, you'll note a very classic gut signature. So the architecture of the wall looks the same, whether you're looking at stomach, small bowel or large bowel and even the appendix. And that wall structure is an alternating hyperechoic and hypoechoic um, wall layer. So you go internally, you'll see the mucosa surrounded by the submucosa that's surrounded by the muscularis propria that's outside surrounded by the serosa. And here again, just because I think it's really important to point out those, those um, structures of interest that really help us kind of zone in on where we should be doing our appendix ultrasound. Um, here's your psoas muscle. So it's this cross section of the muscle. So it looks very meaty um, and that's the psoas muscle. And then you have your iliac vessels that sit right over here. And that's where we usually will start our interrogation of the right lower quadrant looking for the appendix. Now, just to kind of remind you of what you were doing. This is a very challenging application. You are looking for a needle in the haystack. So I encourage you now look at your thumbnail. My thumbnail is actually six millimeters. So my itty bitty little thumbnail is six millimeters. And that's to give you perspective because when you're doing a right lower quadrant ultrasound, you're looking for a structure that is the size of my thumbnail, maybe your thumbnail in the very active contents of the right lower quadrant. So it truly is looking for a needle in the haystack. So here's a clip. And what you can see is here's some small bowel. And the small bowel is moving. It's peristalsing. Right over here is your psoas muscle. It's not the complete psoas muscle. It's just part of the psoas muscle. Over here, you have an iliac vessel that's coming into view. You can see it pulsating. And right over here, right over the psoas muscle, you see this tiny little structure. And that's your appendix. That's your appendix. And that's a normal appendix. So what I should have said is that appendicitis is um, when the appendix measures six millimeters and greater. But your normal appendixes will be smaller than that. They could be 0.2 centimeters, they could be 0.4 centimeters. So you're looking for an exceptionally small structure in the appendix. It's only bigger, six millimeters, when it's inflamed. Um, but a normal appendix is exceptionally hard to see because it's even smaller than the size parameter for appendicitis, so less than six millimeters. So I would say, in addition to starting in the right lower quadrant and, and really scanning deliberately to look for this blind end of tubular structure, it's really helpful to ask the patient where they're having pain because the location of pain can also be helpful in helping you localize um, the, or locate the appendix. And here, what you could see, this is an appendicitis that I found actually in proximity to the, to the kidney. So sometimes you find appendix, appendicitis or appendixes in locations that you weren't even expecting. So point of maximal tenderness or having the patient show you with their finger where they're having the most pain is exceptionally helpful. Case number two, this is a previously healthy 14 year old obese male. His immunizations are up to date and he's presenting to the emergency department with abdominal pain that started two days prior to arrival to the emergency department. Mother reports the child has had three episodes of non-bloody diarrhea and hasn't really wanted to eat. He's had no fever or vomiting, no cough or congestion, 
He does endorse some mild dysuria and he denies sexual activity. His medical history is notable for obesity. He's had actually a cholecystectomy in the past and his family history is non-contributory. On review of systems, he has abdominal pain that's localized to the suprapubic region. And then he's had these three episodes of non-bloody diarrhea. Mom also notes this decreased oral intake, but otherwise he's been fairly at his baseline. On physical exam, you note that his heart rate is elevated. So he's a little bit tachycardic. He's also a little bit, a little bit hypertensive. On general appearance, he looks tired, non-toxic. He has no signs of dehydration. His ENT exam is negative. His lungs are clear. On cardiac exam, you appreciate the tachycardia that you noted on his vital signs. On abdominal exam, his belly is soft, but you note tenderness to palpation in the suprapubic region. His GU exam is negative and he's got breast cap refill bilaterally. So we placed an IV and sent off some labs, gave him a normal saline bolus, obtained a, U, a, a urinalysis. We ordered a radiology ultrasound and also sent a viral pathogen panel. But again, because we do ultrasound in our practice, we brought the bedside ultrasound to the child's bedside. And here what we can see is it's actually less of the abdominal contents that you see, but rather you see this beautiful echogenic stone. So this is very hyperechoic and you see shadowing going deep to the stone. So this is in fact an appendicolith. And in this situation, it's the appendicolith that actually brought our awareness to the appendicitis. Again, measuring the cross-sectional diameter, we note that it meets size criteria being 0.87 centimeters or eight millimeters, 8.7 millimeters. And you can also know that it's blind ended, which is also consistent with um, the appendix. So surgery was consulted and child was started on Zosin and booked for operative management. So as I've alluded to in this lecture, there are certain sonographic parameters or uh, findings that are consistent with appendicitis. So first of all, again, you need your linear probe in order to see the subtleties of the appendix. And what you're looking for is a targetoid, targetoid or bullseye appearing structure. It has a blind end and it is tubular. It's non-compressible. And that's true both of the infected appendix as well as the non-infected appendix. You can't compress down completely the appendix. It lacks peristalsis. You may elicit transduced tenderness, which means once you press down in the right lower quadrant with this graded compression approach where you displace bowel gas, you may elicit tenderness just by the, by the probe. An infected appendix is greater than six millimeters and you may or may not see an appendicolith. So in this example, what you can see again, the appearance of the appendicolith, brightly echogenic structure, it looks like a stone and you have shadowing going deep to the stone. And what you can appreciate is the appendix, the appendicolith actually sits within this tubular structure. Again, this is consistent with appendicitis. In this case, we have two appendicoliths. So again, this is gonna be another example of the approach to performing a uh, appendicitis ultrasound. As we do our pediatric appendicitis study, one thing to keep in mind is those patients that we're gonna be evaluating for appendicitis probably have substantial abdominal pain. I highly encourage you to give them pain medicine before trying to attempt to do an appendicitis study. Also keep in mind, that the gel can be a little bit cold. And so just being mindful and letting the child know that it might feel a little bit cold going on to their belly. For pediatric abdomen, we're gonna always be using our linear probe. So I have a uh, 50 megahertz probe. I'm gonna be using this. Um, it has the benefit of having a fairly large footprint, which I quite like. Um, but if you have a smaller footprint probe, that's fine. You just may have to scan a little bit more of the region to see everything you're looking for. Also keep in mind that with um, the linear probe presets on our machines, there isn't an abdominal pediatric abdomen preset on our linear probe. So I usually um, use a superficial or small part setting. So to do our appendicitis 
study. We're going to go probe marker towards the patient's right. We're going to go down very, very low in the right lower quadrant. And I usually tell my learners um, that you really want to see that pelvic brim in your screen. Um, and so we put the probe down and we are right over. We can see that pelvic brim, that brightly echogenic bone um, that pops into view in the right lower quadrant. I've given myself five centimeters of usable depth. I think that's generally a good amount of depth. Um, somewhere around four to six centimeters is adequate for doing your API studies. So here I see my pelvic brim. I'm just gonna go a little bit medial and then I'm gonna see my beautiful psoas muscle that comes into view. Medial to my psoas muscle, I see my two iliac vessels. If you need clarification to ensure that they are, in fact, vessels, you can always put your color flow Doppler over your vessels to confirm that you're looking at vasculature. And there's my confirmation. If you go further medial, you'll hit the region of the bladder. That's fine. Um, you don't need to be quite that medial for your appy study. So if you see your bladder, just move more lateral. So now as I scan, what's amazing with my little patient over here is I actually found a normal appendix that came into view. Um, it normally doesn't happen this easily, but as you can see right overlying the psoas muscle, there's a circular structure with several layers of um, wall and um, and let me follow it out. Well, that hair stalls away. So hold on one second. Let's see if I can get that back. Oh, it's a little guy right there. So I'm going to freeze right there, right over here. I have found. My normal appendix. So with my patient's normal appendix, um, I found a circular structure with a uh, echogenic center. That's usually because the innermost aspect of the lumen is basically collapsed on itself because there's nothing inside the appendix and her appendix is measuring 0.42 centimeters, which is normal. When you find an appendix, it's wonderful if you can follow it out and see it in its uh, long axis in addition to its cross section. I will try to do that right now as I turn my probe to face uh, northbound in a sagittal plane. And there it is again, but it seems to still have more of a Uh, cross-sectional orientation. As you do your psoas, uh, your appendicitis studies, it's important to know other anatomy that's going to come into view, and most notably in children, is you're going to often see lymph nodes. So right over here, we have a beautiful lymph node that comes into view. We have another lymph node right over here. Two lymph nodes that just came into view over here. Over here and over here. The challenge with your appy study with your patients is gonna be this bowel gas. So what I encourage you to do is as you are scanning, you're wanna, going to want to do a graded compression approach, which is where you're putting gentle pressure and pushing on the bowel to move it out of the way so you can really see that area just overlying the psoas muscle at the area of the iliac vessels. And that's how we found our model's appendix so easily. As you note from the lecture, an inflamed appendix will be quite large, usually more than 0.6 centimeters. There will be wall thickening. There might be fat stranding. Um, and usually there's significant 
transducer tenderness as you're scanning the patient. And that is our ABI study. So there's been a lot of interest, um, as I mentioned earlier, in emergency provider performed ultrasound for appendicitis. As we began using ultrasound more and more in our practice, we began to really appreciate the fact that we can do this too. And so in this meta-analysis, they looked at all 17 studies that have been published um, over the last 20 years, um, looking at how we as emergency providers compare to uh, radiology performed ultrasound. And so what they found actually in terms of the test characteristics is that EP, emergency provider performed point of care ultrasound, had no statistically significant difference when compared to radiology ultrasound for the diagnosis of appendicitis. So you can see over here in, when it comes to sensitivity, specificity, area under the curve, positive likelihood ratio or negative likelihood ratio, no statistically significant difference. In this study, um, they looked at all things that we use in our diagnosis of appendicitis. So looking at everything from the diagnostic accuracy of history and physical exam to lab markers to point of care ultrasound. They did this meta-analysis looking at all parameters to see what is helpful um, and what has high diagnostic accuracy when we're working children up for appendicitis. And what was so nice is that they included the five of the six published pediatric papers um, that looked prospectively at point of care ultrasound for appendicitis. Um, because there was some variability in the number of patients enrolled in each study, they did a pooled analysis. So they put all the patients from all the studies together to look at the test characteristics of point of care ultrasound for appendicitis. And what we can see here is again, exceptionally high diagnostic accuracy. The test characteristics are excellent when it comes to point of care ultrasound for appendicitis. Case number three. So in this case, we have a previously healthy three-year-old female. Her immunizations are up to date and she's presenting to the ED with abdominal pain that started the night prior to arrival to the emergency department. Mom reports that the child has had three episodes of non-bilious, non-bloody vomiting and endorsed dysuria over the last two days. Mother also reports the child had had some vomiting and diarrhea five days ago and was seen by her pediatrician who diagnosed her with gastroenteritis and prescribed Zofran. Child has had no cough or congestion. She does attend daycare and there's been several children out with viral illness. Her medical history is non-significant. She doesn't have any significance to her medical history. Her surgical history is notable for an adenoidectomy and her family history is non-contributory. So in review of systems, we have a non-focal abdominal pain um, that is reported to be a little bit more painful at the suprapubic area, as well as three episodes of non-bilious, non-bloody vomiting and reported dysuria. On her physical exam, she did spike a, a small fever of 100.5 on arrival to the ED and was noted to be tachycardic with a heart rate of 145 and blood pressure that looked higher than normal for age, um, being 122 over 75. This little girl did look dehydrated. Her uh, ENT exam was not significant, but you did appreciate some, we did appreciate some um, tackiness to her mucous membranes. Her lungs were clear. She was noted to be tachycardic on cardiac exam. And on belly exam, her belly looked diffuse uh, or rather distended. And she did endorse diffuse tenderness to palpation, including at the suprapubic region. And she was lying fairly still on, this, on the stretcher. On her extremity exam, you do note that her cap root fill is ever so slightly delayed at two to three seconds. So an IV was placed and labs were sent. Morphine and a normal saline bolus were ordered and we ordered a, a urinalysis as well. And we ordered a radiology ultrasound. And shortly thereafter, nursing came to get us because there was a change. Child now had a blood pressure that had dropped. Her blood pressure was 81 over 54. Four, excuse me, her heart rate was 160, her respirators were up as well at 32, and now she had a cap refill of approximately four seconds. So she was brought to the trauma bay at this point with concern that this child was looking more shocky. She was placed on 100% non-rebreather, 
She was given two normal saline boluses by push-pull method, and after three fast normal saline boluses, her blood pressure improved to 100 over 78. Her heart rate decreased a little to 132, and her respirators came down to 26. At this point, we noted that her belly was quite distended. It was actually now more firm or rigid. So we empirically started her on Zosin and vancomycin. I tried to put the ultrasound down in her right lower quadrant, but truly with her degree of distension, I couldn't see anything with a linear probe. So at this point, I decided to do a FAST exam. And what you can see in this image is that she had a positive FAST exam. You can see that she had fluid between her liver and kidney. I then put the ultrasound probe down on her pelvis, down low, just over her pubic brim. And what I was able to see is she was making urine, which was a good sign, or she was going to be making urine. But we have here a little pocket of free fluid. So this child had a positive fast. So this, is, this changed my management in that at this point I called surgery because I was concerned about free fluid on this child's belly exam. I canceled um, my radiology ultrasound because at this point I didn't think it would have very, very important yield. Um, I discussed with my surgeons that I was concerned for ruptured appendicitis. And at this point we sent um, child to the CT scanner at which point there was confirmation that this child had a ruptured appendicitis with developing abscess. Given the fact that child went into more of a septic state while in the um, emergency department, child was admitted to the PICU with sepsis secondary to ruptured appendicitis. And child um, underwent uh, drainage of her abscess the following day by radiology. So in summary, Making the diagnosis of appendicitis can be challenging, especially because there can be such a varied clinical presentation. When you're using ultrasound or being able to diagnose appendicitis by ultrasound, you have to appreciate this is highly operator dependent and will largely uh, depend on the skill set of the sonographer. But point of care ultrasound um, has incredibly high sensitivity and specificity in the right hands. So if you make this your goal to become expert in point of care ultrasound for appendicitis, you can really change um, or heighten uh, your diagnostic accuracy for appendicitis at the bedside, really make incredible strides to improve the care of your patient, um, be able to disposition your patient much more quickly and it really is a game changer when you become comfortable with this application. Remember, you're going to use a linear probe, and that doesn't matter if your patient is um, a little bit overweight or if they're a tiny, tiny baby. Well, not a baby, a, a younger child. Um, the linear probe is the only way you're going to see the image detail in the right lower quadrant. You want to make sure to address pain prior to performing a point of care ultrasound um, because you're going to be putting significant pressure in that right lower quadrant in order to do this graded compression where you displace bowel gas. And remember the sonographic features of appendicitis. You're looking for a non-compressible tubular structure in the right lower quadrant or the right side of the abdomen, measuring approximately um, six millimeters or greater. I want to thank um, contributors to this to this presentation, um, without whom I could not have had such beautiful images. And I want to thank you for your time and for joining me today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Levine, that was wonderful. And I actually had a question for you. Um, how do you handle it if a child is really nervous about getting the ultrasound? Do you have any tips? That's, that's a great question. And yes, the idea of coming to a patient's bedside with this machine that could be fairly daunting. Um, and I do mention always to, to my patients that the, that the gel, especially in the, in the emergency department where it tends to be a little bit chilly, at baseline, the gel can also be a little bit cold. I really invite them into the discussion um, of like what we're going to be doing. I show them images. I make sure to give them some gel on their hands so they can play with it um, and see that it's not so scary. Um, and then I think it's always, always important, especially if it's a younger child, to engage the parents um, and have the parent be right by the child um, so that they know that they're safe and that everything is going to be okay. Um, and usually using those kind of um, tricks, um, it usually is a lot less of an intimidating or scary experience for the younger child. Right. Understood. Yeah. And what I really appreciated is in, in all of the cases that you mentioned, it, ultrasound was 
you know, not only a way to decrease time to treatment, but, and obviously decrease time of diagnosis, but it was trusted. You know, it seemed like everyone on the team trusted those results. You know, I can see it. This is what's going on. Let's move. You know, it just seemed to be a, a, a nice theme that I picked up on. Yeah, it, it definitely, you know, depending on where you practice and, you know, whether or not the pediatric surgeons have an equal understanding to the importance of point of care ultrasound, um, it could be a little bit varied from, from institution to institution. Um, but once you've proven your skills at sonography, it's hard to challenge that. So it just takes a little bit of time um, to develop those, those relationships with your surgical counterparts. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Right. And uh, to increase your own confidence with the skills as well. Right. Absolutely. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for your time. This was an excellent webinar and uh, I look forward to working with you again. Thank you so much for having me.